Great. So this is the fourth meeting of the Council on Participatory Democracy. The aim is to put together people working on uh, uh, citizens' participation uh, uh, at different scale, but especially at the uh, European scale. Um, and in particular, this edition of the Council on Participatory Democracy will be based on the idea uh, of the connection between democracy and information, democracy and knowledge. Uh, the, starting, the starting point is that uh, we, uh, as humans, uh, a movement of uh, um, civic participation, uh, a wannabe move, pan-European movement of civic participation, let's say, um, we started to run some European um, initiatives, in particular European Citizens' Initiative, which is the main instrument of participatory democracy in Europe, with one million signatories in seven countries. Uh, you can have a, a, an official proposal that will be submitted to the European Commission. Uh, this is the uh, official instrument uh, that it foreseen in the treaties uh, for participatory democracy in Europe, uh, but we are noticing uh, by collecting signatures that there are a lot of obstacles to citizen participation, mainly because uh, European citizens don't know what a European citizen initiative is. Um, there is not really a campaign from the public European institution uh, on what are the ongoing citizens' initiative. And because of that, it's very difficult to involve citizens in that process and to let them know that there is the possibility to sign some uh, initiative that will be uh, then submitted uh, to the European Commission. So uh, because of that, uh, we thought that uh, apart from running uh, citizen, uh, citizens' initiative, it's very important to fight for a reform uh, of participatory democracy in Europe. Um, together with other organization, we submitted a letter to the Commissioner Jurova, uh, which is in charge also for democratic issues, asking for a reform uh, in terms of uh, equal dignity uh, through, uh, between participatory democracy and electoral democracy. Uh, we still have no, res no official response to that letter. Of course, the, ambitious, the ambition is to have equal funding also between, uh, between uh, electoral democracy and participatory democracy. But it's not, also, uh, no, not only a question of funding, it's um, mainly a question of information. So we are today now here to discuss how through uh, a serious process of information from the public European institution, we can have uh, an uh, adequate access to uh, participatory democracy in Europe. Um, I cannot see, uh, still see uh, some of the person that were supposed to uh, introduce the discussion, but okay, we will, uh, um, we, we, we have not uh, a specific uh, order of discussion. So uh, we have some uh, host with us that uh, can, um, can follow the, uh, my, my introduction. Um, before opening the discussion, maybe with uh, uh, Anne Hard of Democracy International that would tell us more about the role of uh, information in fostering a European public sphere, um, I can ask maybe to Marco Cappato to frame a bit this, uh, this discourse. Yes, thank you very much, Lorenzo. Thank you to everybody uh, for being here. Uh, the Council for Participatory Democracy is intended to be a forum um, on uh, discussion on the best practices to promote uh, participation and participa participatory democracy uh, and also to propose uh, reforms. Um, so I think the only thing that uh, I would like to add to the introduction that uh, Lorenzo just made is that uh, I think uh, today is an occasion to share our experiences on, uh, uh, on one side, the importance of information and how to obtain it from local, 
national or supranational institutions. On the other side, we should focus on proposals. Uh, I'm convinced, for example, that we should uh, uh, unite our voices among also different organizations in order to ask to the European Union for the next EU budget uh, to allocate the same amount of money that is usually allocated to inform European citizens about European elections. Well, the same amount of money should be invested in informing European citizens on European citizen initiatives and petitions. Um, there is no point in having a situation in which, uh, when it is uh, election day, more or less everybody knows. Yes, of course, if you are completely uninterested and uh, cut from uh, any kind of source of information, you could even not know in that. But usually, uh, the almost unanimity of the population uh, knows about the fact that today, if you want to vote, you can vote. Well, maybe, of course, it's not enough. You, it doesn't mean that you know uh, which the candidates are or which the proposals are, uh, but uh, currently, uh, I think that if you take 1,000 European citizens, you will probably have uh, one or two of them knowing about the existence of the instrument of European Citizens Initiative. Not even talk about the content of those initiatives. And um, um, I, I have the feeling that in a way, even the promoters of European citizen initiatives that we are, uh, we, we are kind of, uh, um, in a way, we accept the situation. The idea is that uh, uh, election is something for everybody and European citizen initiatives are uh, something only for those who are promoting them. So the burden of informing the people should rely on them. This is false. We don't have to accept this idea. Of course, uh, once a person uh, knows about this instrument and the website where you can check which are the initiatives currently going on, uh, well, the action of the proponents is crucial in order to convince a citizens to sign instead of not to sign. But the instrument, the tool, and uh, a general information about this possibility, I think should be mandatory in the European Union. So, um, the, the, the second thing that I wanted to say is that there are rules also at local level around Europe and around the world also, of course. Um, there are uh, municipalities in which uh, you have the right to convene referendum, you can you have the right to propose things through popular initiatives and you have also some sort of obligation to inform the people about that uh, at the national level uh, we already discussed this uh, last time in switzerland for example citizens receive at their home uh, a letter in which uh, the pros and cons of a referendum are explained. So every and each Europe, uh, uh, Swiss uh, citizens is entitled to receive this kind of information uh, at his home or uh, at her home. So um, Europe should be, uh, this is the second proposal, it should be the, is the place in which the, the European Union, the institution, that is uh, uh, relying and promoting best practices around Europe and also create a kind of uh, uh, obligation to activate possibility of uh, 
European of the European initiative and information about uh, those initiatives because uh, uh, the European Union already uh, intervened and took action about, uh, for example, uh, the TV information, the pluralism principle on uh, TV information. So there is no reason why uh, citizen information should be limited to election and not extended to participation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. It was very important to frame the discussion with these uh, elements. Um, since there are still uh, a few speakers that will uh, join the discussion, I would say that we can start uh, with uh, some speech, but then you, you can also uh, write in the chat, raise your hand by writing in the chat, and if you want to make a point or ask question, um, you feel free to do it. But first, let me uh, introduce you Anne Hart, which is part uh, of the board of uh, Democracy International. Uh, as the name of the organization says very well, Democracy International is very involved in democratic issues, especially at, in, uh, at the EU scale. So I would say, Anne, which are, in your view and for your experiences, uh, the main obstacles uh, or to uh, democratic participation in Europe, uh, especially regarding the lack of information. Um, yeah, <laughs> I prepared a little something. Um, I have my eight minutes, right? <laughs> um, so first of all, a short introduction or hello, everyone. And um, just for you to know, so during the last two and a half years, I've been traveling Europe's public places to hold mini conventions on Europe in a wooden dome. Maybe some of you have already seen the project. And um, yeah, as my topic, it's, it's called European Public Sphere and also aims to create such a sphere that we're talking about and that connecting Europe and its citizens and especially at increasing citizens' participation in EU decisions. And yeah, my input today will draw largely <laughs> on this field experience uh, experience with our, our European Public Sphere project, um, having held more than 100 discussions in eight countries. So <laughs> first of all, what I need to say is that, and we've also mentioned, already mentioned this, that in general, and unfortunately, when it comes to the EU, it's mostly not a part of people's daily lives let alone that they know about participatory mechanisms like the ECI. Um, they're just not known by the majority of people. Yeah, <laughs> this is also due to the quality of information on the EU, provided by the EU, but also by the media. Yeah. Um, as I said, I tried to summarize a bit what the people we met uh, in town squares, etc said about this topic um, <laughs> and yeah there are two positive points to mention and these are really the only two positive points that we could find and um, that first of all there are press centers <laughs> of european institutions with the possibility to sign up for a newsletter in your language and then the second point is that the eu provides lots of informational materials and that's really it <laughs> Then um, the negative aspects, we have a long list. I tried to shorten it a bit, but I will give you an overview. So um, people think that, or a lot of people thought that the EU itself has a communication problem. The information does not reach the people and the information is just not well communicated. There is mostly no access to this information. There are no points of contact with the citizens and no real opportunity to get informed. And also the EU is very complex. So getting and staying informed properly to, to form an actual opinion is basically a full-time job. So, and what is really important, um, yeah, and this was also really interesting for me to see that even if the information does reach the right people, um, the European communication, the, the language style, is just not understandable for most citizens. Also here we have a huge problem. 
Um, for example, much communication, uh, for example, on Facebook is done in English, German and French, but not in the other of the 24 <laughs> languages that we have in the EU. Yeah, um, then a quick look at external media. So most people thought the EU is not covered or not covered enough in the newspapers that um, we have a very fragmented media landscape and one-sided information on the EU, which prevents yeah, um, a proper European public sphere. Of course, we have the problem of fake news, and that makes it difficult for citizens to find reliable sources. Yeah, what's the result of this? Um, people feel or say that they are not informed properly, um, that most people do not have an understanding of how European decisions affect citizens' daily lives or how they can influence them. And this also leads to citizens being surprised about decisions, which of course is <laughs> very bad. Um, yeah, it is unclear to citizens what the benefits of the European Union are, of the European Union are, and what the EU has done for them. And um, and this was quite shocking to me. We've heard this in many places that we have a problem of growing distrust. So people distrust their political institutions not only at European level but in general, which also in return prevents them from learning from them because they feel it's, it's, it's more like propaganda for these political institutions. Yeah, so what we see here, the right information is crucial for developing a European public sphere. And that's actually what I would like to devote the rest of my time to. So what can we do about this? What are the actual recommendations for the creation of a European public sphere through proper information? Um, and again, these are ideas that we gathered while traveling around Europe. So, <laughs> first of all, we need to make communication less complicated and in all 24 EU languages. Um, yeah, many people or some people suggested a marketing department for European citizens. Um, in general, the EU has to do a better job at promoting itself. For example, in terms of re raise the standards of living for you, um, yeah, active promotion on the possibilities Europe offers. Then um, more explanations of the advantages of membership, European processes, purposes. Yeah, one participant also called it a fetishization uh, to create a European spirit as our current system is based on fetishization. Then, um, of course, EU activities outside of the EU bubble to raise awareness that the EU is in fact not only in Brussels, but shapes people's everyday lives. Um, some people suggested a European newspaper in different languages. Uh, this could be one of the, the mediums um, or a platform that channels available information on Europe, a reliable platform where people can get informed and they don't have all this wealth of information. Um, and also some younger participants said maybe notifications, advertisements on social media so people um, yeah, get the information delivered and it actually reaches them. Then, at the political level, um, I cannot emphasize this enough. Um, it has been said basically in every place we went to, more citizen participation, more direct democracy, because it creates a better understanding of Europe and makes it more legitimate for the citizens. It makes politics more interesting for the people, and it fosters political discussions in people's everyday lives. So actually, that's how such a European public sphere is created. Um, yeah, these tools need to be stronger. We've also mentioned this already. We need to make the ECI more known to citizens. We need to make it attractive to sign, for example, through lower signature thresholds, um, a more transparent reaction to ECIs, and um, possibly a binding referendum at the end of the citizens initiated process. Yeah. <laughs> and um, what was also suggested, a lot of times is that we should create more and yeah holistic innovative consultative dialogue formats um, also between citizens and politicians 
These can then serve as a um, contact point with the EU so that people also realize that their voice is actually being heard in politics. Um, yeah, it also helps to bring people closer together because they can discuss these topics together. It fosters exchanges of opinions. And this, <laughs> I thought is really important, is that it enables nuanced positions on, yeah, nuanced positions and critical discussions on the EU instead of this pure division into pro and anti-EU stances that we see at the moment. Yeah, I tried to give you a short overview. Um, I'm through Thank you with my notes. No, it, it was uh, actually very precious and I really encourage you Anne, to share with us your notes because there was a lot of stuff and this could be very useful uh, for, uh, for us. As I said in the introduction, we wrote uh, a few months ago, uh, before the pandemic, uh, a letter to the Commissioner Jurova asking for a, a reform in terms of information and funding uh, of the participatory democracy instruments. But of course, since we received no answer apart from uh, the, 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 the news from the cabinet of the Commissioner that uh, the, the letter was taken into account, received no answer. So it mm -hmm. would be good after this council to relaunch this initiative and maybe to have uh, more requests and i think that your notes can be very useful to complete our letter and maybe to to present it as something um, as an output of this council so maybe also democracy international could be interested in that and we can keep in touch uh, to see if uh, all these uh, elements that you uh, were pointing out in uh, your speech could be part of this uh, initiative and of this letter maybe. So keep in touch for, for that and thank you for your contribution uh, with this speech. Um, and now uh, we still can uh, um, discuss about um, the reform of participatory democracy in Europe and the importance of knowledge. Um, since I can see that he's with us and he was one of the speakers, I would like to give the floor to Alessandro Ciofini from the um, Pirate uh, Party. Um, Alessandro is also working on a European Citizens uh, Initiative uh, on file sharing. So, uh, uh, Alessandro, can you maybe tell us more about this European Citizen Initiative and also about uh the obstacles maybe that you are finding in uh, running this initiative yes thank you thank you lorenz thank you thanks everybody i'm i'm really glad to be here with you um you know i'm i'm involved into the pirate movement since two, 2012 and um, as probably you already know pirates all over europe are always interested since the very beginning uh, into uh, participation. Um, so we we experience a lot of um, in, in our organization a lot of um, uh, direct democracy, liquid democracy. We have in in many many parties around Europe no boards. So uh, this this uh, topic is really important for us. Um, and yes, actually, uh, we um, uh, in Italy we start with with. Um, uh, a new um, ECI just just approved by the Commission last May, the 15 on file sharing. It, 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 it's called freedom to share, and um, we also spread this voice at the European level because we have um, uh, an, an uh, extra organization that is actually the the European Pirate Party um, that probably will soon became a real um, a real European. Uh, a party um yes the thing is that um this is our first in european citizen initiative and um we're still a bit confusing you know i i, I saw um uh, i i really really um listened very carefully to Anna's speech about the the pros and cons and uh we are ex we're really experiencing a lot of cons but we we still believe that in uh, at somehow the European Citizen Initiative is still um, a valid way to promote something at the European level, something that starts from 
from citizen. I don't think that, that maybe there are a lot of problems. For instance, uh, communication is really one of the most uh, uh, important topic. But in my opinion, um, what Anne said, said before is, is very, very important. She took, she pointed out um, a, a very important, um, a, a very important clue about uh, um, the relationship between organization. The fact is that we are living not only in Italy but all over all over Europe. Uh, I think even in France, German, uh, Hungary, uh, Poland, uh, Spain, from the citizen, really, um, um, you know, a strange point of view regarding institutions. And, and, and politician institutions uh, too. And uh, as far as they are, uh, you know, far away from their everyday life, maybe, maybe um, you know, citizens are more, more, not interested, but they trust more. They're, they're unfortunately, they're little everyday, uh, you know, measures or, 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 or um, politicians that are locally uh you know uh, limited because they can see they can even know them better they can see what happened more directly but but they don't trust to the, at the national level politics and especially at the european um, level pol politics and this is uh, really painful because it reflects absolutely in, in, in dramatically a negative way in also all the initiatives because for instance, one million, we have to collect one million of signatory within a year, right? Uh, in, in at least seven different countries with various uh, uh, amount. For instance, for Italy, it's just uh, around 50, 55, I think, thousand uh, signatures. That, that, that uh, in, in my point of view, should be really nothing in a year to collect this, all this signature because we, you know, we have potentially, we can potentially reach 40 millions of inhabitants during a, a year. And with, with, with some, you know, uh, incredible, um, for our, for our, I mean, in our intention, uh, totally uh, cross uh, uh, ages and, and cross, uh, everybody know what, what does it mean to share a file. Uh, share a song, share a book title, and especially now that we have experienced this, this lockdown all over Europe. So, um, for instance, uh, in my opinion, we don't have to think about lowering the limits, but, but to gain, I don't know how, but to gain trust. Because, uh, because trust and interest are, are, you know, on the same boat, on the same ship. Um, people lose interest when they lose trust because they, they, they consider themselves just, you know, not citizen, not just the right to vote. Uh, why I should just put there a signature? Even me, that I am one of the promoters of this ECI, I'm, uh, of course, uh, I would be absolutely glad if one year, next 2021, we will be there at, in Brussels to listen, at least to present the our initiative to the European Commission, right? But then what next? Even me, I don't know if, I, I, I don't, I mean, I still don't believe that the European Commission then uh, collects everything and after listening to us, let's promote a law at the European level to the parliament. And even if something will arrive to the parliament and the law becomes, let's say, you know, a law, what next? You see, so so the, I, I'm uh, I don't want to be off topic. I I do apologize if I if I did already. But the things is that um, it's hard to create a real um, participation from the ground when the institution seems to be, let's say, let let me let me say, useless and far far away from the everyday life. And of course, we know that this is absolutely not true. Uh, you, you remember, you remember the the roaming. Roaming is one of the biggest example of, of of successful campaigning in Europe. The freedom, really, really, and and even more than Schengen, because you know, 
Schengen is for me one of the best, um, uh, let me say, idea from this Europe. But you, you know, when you just land in, in Berlin airport from Milan and you just switch your phone on and you call everybody freely, you know, this, this, is, this was really one successful example. But uh, except this one, I can even me myself that I'm involved somehow, even if it's in a small par uh, party, I cannot, I cannot say, for instance, we, we, we were fighting last year against the copyright uh, reform that unfortunately uh, the parliament uh, delivered last March. But even though this campaign that will potentially affect a lot of uh, aspects in the everyday life of, of uh, all the European citizens, was not uh, seen by all the people like a, a very impactful um, aspect, you know? So uh, I think that, yes, for sure, for sure, we need to ask, I agree with Marco uh, that we need, that, that we should ask for at the European level to put some money into the communication, but, but you know, not just like propaganda, because propaganda in this way, in my opinion, shouldn't work. We're just um, trying, you know, to, I don't know, to manage all, all the communication campaign for this European uh, initiative that basically would like to uh, give the opportunity to legalize file sharing for everybody for private use, just, you know, to, to have a, a little compensation from our internet access. So let's say I'm just talking about, I mean, just, uh, um, uh, the, the European, our European initiative uh, core is just basically just you pay something in your in your connection to the to the net. So uh, why don't just give a little fraction of this amount to all the, the authors? But please, uh, let's share whatever we want from you know from everywhere in Europe. Okay, this is the basic concept. But. Anyway, even if it, it will fail this campaign, we will use this this instrument, this this powerful instruments, to at least point out the citizen into the big problem that is file sharing. Because file sharing, avoiding file sharing, means to lock down the knowledge. You know, because if I buy a book, I can give my book to Lorenzo, to Marco, okay, to okay, Anna. Sadio, sorry. Oh, Let, sorry. Yeah. Stay also to the topic because yeah. if not everybody is talking about what uh yeah I mean, I, you're right doing, i'm sorry uh, it doesn't work it, okay yeah uh, i'm sorry uh, i, I see the opportunity to say that i was not talking about um when i when i mentioned com communication i talked about information so i'm not pretending that the european union does the propaganda work uh, this is up to the uh, to the promoters of an initiative to do, like, let's call it the communication or propaganda work. The duty of the institution is to inform about the, the tool and the possibility to sign. And that is a very, uh, very distinct aspect uh, that could uh, go through institutional uh, uh, channels. Okay. Yes, I agree. Yeah, I, I agree with you. But the problem is that, uh, um, you know, as I told before, as I just said, um, even for referendum, we have a long history of referendum in Italy that didn't get the quorum. Why, in your opinion? Maybe because, yes, because a lot of them uh, uh, were use, useless referendum, but anyway, each time we ask citizens to participate and the citizens say, Okay, I know, I know that this, this instrument exists, but I don't care. So, in my opinion, the problem is not only to inform citizens in, at the European level that the, this instrument exists, but to empower the, the power of the tool itself, the power yeah. of, of the instrument itself. I think, Alessandro, your point is very clear and uh, th these two things are probably not in contradiction. You can run both for uh, changing the rule on information on uh, the current instrument and also to ask for a reform of the instrument itself and to 
empower it to be more uh, impactful. And I think that we have the same, uh, the same scope. Uh, but now let me shift to another topic, which is somehow connected with our discussion, because we have with us uh, Professor Cesare Pitea, um, which uh, was part of the board um, in charge of the Staderini de Lucia versus Italy case. What I'm talking about? Well, it's uh, a very um, important uh, uh, case uh, uh, of discussion that has been discussed at the um, United Nations, uh, in particular at the uh, Human Rights Committee. Italy has been condemned, uh, let's say, uh, condemned, it's not juridically, maybe Cesare will correct me, the, the good term, but there is a decision of the um, uh, Human Rights Committee uh, saying that Italy has not um, give the right uh, information, but not only information, uh, access to citizens uh, regarding instruments of participatory democracy. So uh, once again, Italy is doing uh, school, in this case, in a negative way um, for, for uh, other, other countries. So let's see what's happened with that decision. And uh, maybe if what happened in Italy could be an example uh, for uh, uh, other country also. Thank you, Cesare, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, can you hear me? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, a uh, special hello to Marco, which I had the opportunity to work with last summer on a seminar on a different topic. And uh, I apologize in advance because I can't be with you for a very long time. Uh, I, I will have like 40, 45 minutes. So I will try to be brief so that I can address your uh, questions or, or we can have a discussion if you uh, if you will wish so. So the, the case um, is a case uh, about uh, something that is at the same time uh, yeah, usual and unacceptable. So if the case relates to the problem of the um, system for the collection of signatures for the presentation of a referendum in accordance with the Italian constitution and the fact that in fact uh, um, the um, public authorities uh, that should cooperate with the promoters of the referendum in order to allow them uh, to do so uh, normally uh, do not. And this is especially due to the fact that there is a requirement for a physical collection of, um, uh, of a significant number of signatures, as we know, uh, five 100,000 signatures, uh, and those signatures have to be um, uh, authenticated by certain specific uh, civil servants, including uh, um, uh, municipal secretary uh, and uh, other members of the municipal and local authorities. Uh, on the other hand, the law does not provide an obligation for any of those subjects to be available for this activity. So uh, this is the thrust of uh, this was the thrust of the case. So basically, the fact that there is this high requirement, this high threshold, and and a formalistic approach to the collection of uh, of signatures on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, there is no obligation, legal obligation on those who are supposed to cooperate in order for the um, uh, signatures to be collected to do so. That has resulted in the inability uh, to collect uh, the number of information of uh, signatures requires. And this was the case was uh, relating to a specific, um, uh, to a specific, um, referendum uh, it was the uh, the referenda uh, of um uh, uh sorry um, um the referenda of 2013 2014 that the uh, the 
um, the period of time that is um, that is uh, uh, interested by the uh, by the decision. So this complaint was brought to the um, uh, Human Rights Committee, which is a non-judicial expert uh, expert uh, body uh, which oversees the implementation of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, a UN treaty uh, to which Italy is a party uh, along with other a significant number of other states around the world. Um, um, the, I, the Human Rights Committee does not have binding powers, I will come back to this, but in fact works as a tribunal. So uh, there is an individual application that was brought uh, by uh, Mario Staderini and other applicants on behalf of the promoters of the uh, referenda that uh, did not reach the number of signatures required uh, and uh, against Italy. Uh, before the committee and in the in in this uh, petition uh, it was alleged uh, that uh, the situation as it was both on the paper both on the black letter law and in the actual implementation of uh, the legal requirements uh, constituted a violation of article 25 of uh, the ICCPR, which uh, protects the rights to political participation. So, um, as as it was said uh, in the introduction to my to my short intervention, the uh, outcome of the case was favorable to the applicants in the sense that uh, the uh, committee did find a violation of Article 25, also in conjunction with Article 2, which requires states to provide effective remedies for violations of uh, rights uh, protected by the uh, covenant. Um, what is the interest of this, uh, of this case? Well, the first uh, observation I want to, the first point, very important point I want to make is that um, the reasoning of the committee is based on the following idea. So first is that Article 25 does not impose a specific form of democracy, of democratic participation. Mm? Requires the state to have to have a minimum standard, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, standard has evolved over time. As you can imagine, uh, there was a huge confrontation about the meaning of this right in, during the Cold War, when, of course, on the one end, uh, the, the, the liberal states were arguing for it to be as a, a, a right to multi-party democracy, which, of course, the communist bloc denied. But then this period uh, um, passed, and uh, there is like now a common understanding of the content of this article as requiring at least representative democracy. But at the same time, the interesting uh, aspect of Article 25 is that it is not limited to uh, uh, to representative democracy. It also covers, and that's the first important uh, aspect that is uh, underscored by the decision, uh, it also covers tools of direct democracy. However, it doesn't impose itself specific type of uh, direct, direct democracy tools. Uh, mm, so how is it possible that Italy was in violation of Article 25 relating to referenda when Article 25 done, does not impose on state an obligation to have this tool of direct democracy? Well, this is the interplay between the international level, legal level, so the treaty, and uh, national constitution or national laws, domestic law in general. So the committee basically said that since uh, this tool of direct democracy is covered by Italian constitution, Article 8, as we all know, uh, then uh, under Article 25, states have an obligation 
to make the rights recognized by domestic constitutional or ordinary law effective. And that was uh, the main problem. So the, the court, the, the, sorry, the committee concluded that the regulation and the implementation of the regulation on referenda, uh, so the law of 1970 uh, uh, in particular, uh, did not make this right enshrined in the constitution effective. So it was an excessive burden for the promoters of the referendum, uh, basically nullifying the right recognized, a right to public participation recognized in the Italian constitution and therefore a violation of uh, Italy's obligations under the covenant. The second point, which I think is very important, is uh, related to the concept that we all have uh, in, uh, in mind of the rule of law. So basically, not only the problem was that there were certain rights that were theoretically recognized, but not um, um, but without a, a meaningful way to be uh, exercised, but there was no judge to complain about it. So the second very important dimension of this decision is that Italy was also found in violation of the covenant because there was no effective remedy, there was no judge, no independent institution which had the power to address complaints um, similar to those that were made before the committee basically, of course, based on national law in that case. Um, um, what are the consequences? So after having found that Italy was not uh, in compliance with Article 24 and, uh, 25 and Article 2 of the Covenant, what the committee did? The committee, well, first ordered the, um, uh, Italy, uh, the Italian government, to make full reparation uh, for individuals uh, concerned, but most importantly for uh, our purposes and for the purposes of those who have promoted the case actually that was a strategic litigation case is that the committee asked Italy to review its legislation stating uh, very clearly that Italy has to review the legislation on referenda uh, so that no undue excessive burden is uh, placed on the promoters of the referendum uh, in the collection of signatures. Uh, in particular, the um, committee raised three points that are uh, which the legislation has to be changed. The, the first relates to the ways to obtain signature. So as I said uh, before, we are still in the 19th century in, in this uh, in this respect. So yeah, you need a physical, uh, a physical collection on a, a sheet that has to be uh, stamped in advance and then you have the authentication of the signature while we know the, uh, that uh, we now have um, technology that would allow probably uh, a more swift and um, equally secure collection of the of the signatures. Of course, the, uh, the committee doesn't go so far as to suggest that this is the solution that has to be adopted. Another solution could be to lower the number of required uh, signatures. So there is a margin of discretion for Italy on how to implement this recommendation. But for sure, one point is ways how the signatures are collected. The second point is where the signatures are collected. So if like a, a system of physical collection is maintained, mm, the state has to provide uh, accessible spaces to the citizens. Because, of course, if the, uh, if the uh, signatures can be collected only uh, from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. on Saturday uh, afternoon in a, a specific 
room of a municipality, it becomes very difficult to, for the citizens to actually access that place. So also in terms of physical places of where the signatures can be collected uh, has to be reformed uh, in order to facilitate uh, the access of citizens to this to the process and the third and maybe the most important for uh, the discussion today area in which Italy is required to make changes is information so the um, the committee explicitly uh, and precisely identified information to the citizens on the process of collecting the signatures how this happens, where this happens, what you have to do, what you can do, what are allegedly the referenda about some information also on the content. Because if you say uh, you can go and sign for something that you don't know what it is, it becomes very uh, ineffective as an information. So this is the third area in which uh, a, um, a reform, a legislative reform is required. So the last point, and then I will um, I will uh, leave the floor uh, for questions and and comments. Is what is the um, the legal and uh, non legal effect of these um, of these uh, views? That's the term, the correct term, views of the committee. Uh, as I said, the committee doesn't have binding power. It's not an international court. Mm -hmm. Uh, is an international uh, non-judicial or quasi-judicial body uh, that work, uh, works like a court but does not have the powers of a court. So it's just a recommendation. But then the committee itself uh, monitors the implementation of its own recommendations. So Italy will be required to uh, report to the committee on what they did in order to implement the recommendations in this case. So basically, um, more than a legal tool, uh, like hard legal tool, this is a soft uh, legal tool that can be used for uh, uh, advocacy, for lobbying, uh, both internally, domestically, um, towards the uh, members of the parliament, the political groups, and, uh, and and of course the public opinion, but also internationally uh, within the within the the committee because uh, NGOs and non-state actors can also have an influence on this process of reporting and monitoring. Uh, so it is important uh, that this um, uh, this uh, decision is followed up before the committee by. Uh, the civil by the civil society, the promoters, and the uh, groups that are allowed to make uh, the comments and observations in the process. Thank you, thank you very much, Cesare. I think your intervention was very important because this is not just an Italian or a technical matter. It's a European and also international matter because, as you said, it's the first time uh, that there is a, a decision of the um, Human Rights Committee regarding direct democracy at the UN level. So this is uh, setting a very important precedent that can be uh, useful for uh, important for any other country, I think. So my, my first question, since uh, you said you have to go, uh, is about that. Do you think that this is a case that could be useful for uh, other other country, also maybe at Europe for the European Union for the rules of uh, participatory democracy in Europe? Well, I... uh, and maybe Cesar, if I can add, so that you yes, can, sure. Um, reply to everybody. If there are uh, other questions, of course, are more than welcome. Um, about the specific uh, topic of information. Um, which margin are you um, are you seeing for going to the UN uh, on uh, lack of information cases uh, on participatory democracy?
Jesse, uh, you have to open the microphone. Yeah. Yeah. No, the microphone is closed okay. now. It's open. <laughs> okay. It takes it takes some some seconds. Sorry, I was waiting for for uh, more questions if there were. So I can I can start. So the okay the the general relevance of this case uh, is um, limited in the sense that the the favorable outcome of the case is based on the interplay between. Uh, international obligations and domestic regulations domestic laws constitutional law in our case um, so basically the principle that uh, so to speak spreads uh, beyond italy is the principle that once tools of direct democracy are established at the national level states party to the iccpr have an obligation to make them effective and this is important because uh, apart from referenda there are other instruments other tools of direct democracy that are covered by international agreements i think uh, for example uh, about the orus convention in environmental matters uh, european legislation on uh, uh, on um, public participation in this field um, and uh, all the uh, uh, let's say eu uh, eu um, rules on forms of citizens direct participations which as we know are not uh, extremely developed so basically uh, the answer to your question is it is hard to use this case to promote the establishment of um, uh, tools of direct democracy as a legal obligation under the iccpr also taking into account that the EU is not a party to the ICCPR, that's another problem. Um, what can be used of this is that um, beyond the formalities of the EU being um, bound by the ICCPR, this means that the existing um, tools of direct democracy or perspective tools of direct democracy that can be defined and designed at the EU level must take into account this principle of effectivity. So it cannot be uh, just a um, lip service to, the, the, to direct participation. Once you make a decision as a state or as an organization uh, like the EU to uh, establish these these um, uh, tools of uh, participation, then you have to make them effective. Um, as to Marco's question, the lack of information uh, regarding uh, referenda, you meant. So the problem of yes, any kind of. Uh... A participatory democracy tool that is already foreseen by the internal law if i were understood but for, for example if i have a, a law uh, accept which is including a referendum or a, a popular ballot initiative um, there can be an obligation to inform the people about it I, I well, I think yes. I think this decision incorporates somehow in Article 25 a requirement that is already a requirement under freedom of expression. So uh, I think that cases may be built. Uh, we have well, a few years ago, I would say, but a lot of years ago, indeed, almost 20 years ago, uh, I was also trying to do that with um, the radical party to, to expose this issue of political information at the international level. Uh, I think there are spaces uh, to claim 
to claim that under freedom of information, there is a right of citizens to be informed about political processes. So when we have uh, a, um, a system uh, of uh, information that basically cuts out systematically certain parties, uh, this can be a problem. Of course, this is a very general consideration, but I, I would say that this issue is covered under under freedom of information. Um, more more specifically, um, more specifically, what this decision tell us is that. Uh, the citizens need to be informed about the processes. So I think this is not exactly what you were asking. So like if there is a lack of information, for example, on how to vote or where to vote is a different issue from uh, information on like political communication, the content of like pluralism and, and stuff. This is more covered under uh, freedom of information, I think. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cesare. Um, I think it was very important to include this um, topic on the discussion, and we will see if this can be useful maybe uh, for another country, uh, since the, the, there is this important precedent to, to um, start a, a legal initiative uh, regarding uh, the, the, the lack of uh, access to participatory democracy tools. Um, and now I will reframe the discussion on uh, uh, Europe and uh, on uh, European uh, uh, tools of participatory democracy. Uh, in particular, I would like to give the floor to Marie Corman that was writing in the chat that she is uh, um, the, um, she is involved in a, in a program which is called. Uh, uh, European uh, Europe for Citizens. She's also um, involved in an activity with Agora Bruxelles. So thank you, Maria, for joining uh, Marie for joining the council, and uh, the floor is yours. Yes, um, thank you for giving me the floor. Um, so a f just a few words on Europe for Citizens. It's a program um, that has run now, uh, that has been running for uh, seven years and is coming to an end this year. Um, as you know, we work uh, with the European budget on a time span of seven years, and 2020 is the final year in this time span, and we are now preparing the next multi-annual financial framework, as we call it. Um, I have listened with high interest to uh, your call for using simple language um, and so I will try to do so, but it is true that um, when uh, we try and explain European things, um, usually we use acronyms, for instance, the next um, budgetary period um, running from next year onwards until 2027. Usually we refer it um, using the acronym MFF, multi annual financial framework. So the Europe for Citizens program is coming to an end. There will be another program starting next year, uh, which will be called most probably Citizens Equality of Rights and, and Values. We support projects um, under Europe for Citizens, uh, projects of democratic engagement and civic participation also projects where civil society in Europe and local authorities try to uh, draw lessons from recent history and in order to avoid repeating some mistakes in the future, so to prepare them. Excuse future. me, Marie, uh, the audio is very, very poor. Can you mm, take the, the microphone close to your mouth, maybe? Maybe. I'll, um, is it better this way? Yeah, it's, it's probably this microphone of the earphones. Um, you have it. Yeah, yeah you yeah. just, uh, you can try like this. Okay, so the projects we support 
are projects relating to, to support, to promote democratic engagement and civic participation, and also projects that try to draw lessons from recent history in Europe to build a, a better future. Um, the funding is limited, and the challenge we have also in terms of communication is that um, when we publish calls for proposals, we receive many proposals, but the funding is limited. And so the expectations are high, the quality of the proposals is high, but the funding is limited. So uh, we need to find a balance because if we communicate and raise too many expectations, then we also create a lot of disappointment. So that's the first balance that we need to try and reach so have uh, successful programs running at the same time not create too much disappointment um, another uh, challenge is one in terms of accountability of course we are accountable to the european parliament and to european citizens because this is european money that we are spending to uh, implement such programs at the same time we have to make sure that the administrative burden is remains limited but reaching out through small projects to our citizens groups across our about 30 countries because we have eu member states but also other countries joining in it's it's really difficult to to get the, the right balance between reach out and involvement on the one hand and keeping things uh, manageable from an administrative point of view. And so we are looking for ways of uh, being able to allocate as much money to, as possible to grass to organizations working at grassroots level at the same time, we have to make sure that we remain accountable, efficient, and that we can justify that European money has been well spent and has gone to the right people on the ground. So you see, while I have listened to uh, your concerns and your calls for improvement with much interest, and also with sympathy, because I'm also a citizen, um, at the same time, as a civil servant working for the European Commission, I would like to underline some of the challenges that we face. And this will not change in the next financial period, because there, um, you know, also given the pandemic and the revision of priorities uh, that we have, all the discussions, uh, the ongoing discussions for the moment to uh, try and recover from this um, pandemic. Um, it will be, you know, the, the limitations in funding will still be with us, the limitations in staff, in resources uh, for such programs will still be there. Um, and so we will have to deal with the same challenges further on. On Agora in Brussels, um, this is um, a citizens movement that I have joined recently, so I'm still in the learning process. Um, the idea is to uh, test if we can have more participatory democracy through selecting citizens at random, randomly, and involving them in local policy making. So Agora focuses on Brussels, I leave the European sphere and then I work on a more uh, um, on a narrower um, geographic scope and there we are testing if by selecting people uh, ordinary citizens at random we uh, can reach better um, results in terms of participatory uh, democracy it's a new movement. Um, it started uh, just a few years ago. We have uh, already developed uh, things quite well. I have been personally impressed by 
uh, everything that has already been achieved. Uh, but of course, uh, we still have a long way to, to go uh, if we want to make it institutional, to integrate it uh, at institutional level. So I don't want to take the floor too long, in particular if the sound is not very good. That's all I wanted to share. Uh, I don't know if this is of interest to you and if I have answered, met your expectations. Thank you for listening. Thank you. It was, def it was definitely very interesting. And I already have a question. I also encourage uh, people to ask questions because we are still waiting for a couple of the speakers that will uh, that still ha haven't joined the discussion so we can have uh, a time for debating uh, waiting for the speaker uh, so my first question to marie would be regarding agora uh, since i know a bit of this project that to me is very interesting um how do you i know that there are some uh, elected representative of agora at the same uh, level at some level in, uh, in Belgium. Uh, so how do you conciliate uh, this uh, um, uh, these, uh, uh, involvement in uh, random selection and uh, uh, the fact of um, being taking part to election? Uh, do you think it's a contradiction or maybe do you think that it's possible to do both things? Look, I have no mandate to speak on behalf of Agora today. So I will share with you my observations as a simple citizen. What I have observed is that we have one elected MP uh, with us. And this makes it possible for this uh, movement, this uh, initiative uh, on the ground to access all kinds of services and facilities and for, for instance venues where we can meet so um, it really helps because i have participated in other citizens initiatives before and already finding venues was always something that we needed to to solve find solutions that were acceptable to all to, available facilities in, in Brussels. So it has this advantage. Now the um, elected assembly, uh, the, the assembly that has been elected at random, my understanding is that they have chosen to work on housing. Um, but unfortunately, because of the pandemic, this coronavirus then came in and it's been possible to keep to protect the uh, the movement by continuing online but it is true that we've not been able to move forward as we had thought we, we would so the the idea was that the um, elected people would feed their thoughts and their views and their proposals into uh, the policy making carried by the MEP but it, the, this chain, this sequence has been disrupted by the pandemic. That's what I have been able to observe, but honestly, I'm still very much learning on Angora. Okay, no, thank you very much. That was very interesting because uh, we do believe that uh, uh, electoral democracy and new forms of democracy as Sutitian can be complementary somehow. And so it's interesting to see our movement doing this thing in, uh, in Belgium is realizing that actually. Uh, okay, so we are waiting for uh, a couple of person joining the discussion, but Mark, Sorry, so maybe I will take the opportunity of uh, Virgilio Dastoli uh, connected. I don't know if Virgilio, are you hearing me? Yeah, because yeah. The... Here, unfortunately, I had the problem with the internet in the last twenty minutes, so I okay, I, okay. It was not but possible because... for me to follow the discussion. Be but I know that uh, you are uh, well. Of course, you are an expert of uh, European institutions, and you already pointed that asked um, some uh, 
work that the, the European Union and uh, namely the um, European Parliament is doing, at least in reporting the experiences of uh, civic participation. So uh, if it's possible to view, I would ask you on one side, uh, um, like a, a, a summary of what you know about uh, uh, European Union uh, let's say support uh, on uh, participatory democracy and on the other side a more political uh, opinion on what uh, would be possible to do uh, even uh, after the experience that we have made together on the a European citizen initiative on the rule of law and the difficulties that we encountered in practical terms so uh, both on a compendium of European law and uh, on the other side and the political proposal uh, I would ask you to take the floor now yeah yeah concerning the citizens initiative as you know we have now a new uh, new rules uh, that started the first of January uh, apparently these new rules uh, could uh, uh, facilitate the record of the signatures but they're not so sure that the change in the rules are so strong uh, and so revolutionary to give to the citizens more co co possibility to uh, to use this uh, this instrument my idea but that, that is a question that concerns the debate on the future of Europe is that because the parliament is asking to uh, have the power of legislative initiative my idea but it's an idea that i supported at the beginning from the beginning is that the citizens initiative has to be an initiative to be addressed not to the commission but to the parliament because the parliament more than the commission uh, has this sensibility to take into account the uh, opinion the, and the influence of the citizens. Uh, as you know, that uh, it exists the petition, but that is a, a problem for the, for the future. Concerning the, the second point of the participatory democracy, you know that the parliament insists on the fact to convoke this uh, European conference on the future of Europe. Unfortunately, I see that the Parliament is very, uh, uh, what I can say, very sensitive to the uh, uh, role of the Council. The debate that they made, the, that they made the 17th of June, uh, all the MEPs that took the floor uh, said, ah, uh, please, please, Council, uh, assume a decision concerning uh, the conference of the Jew of Europe. I'm sure that if Spinelli was a member of the parliament of Marco Pannella, they said it's our role to start the debate on the future of Europe and not uh, 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 ask, uh, uh, wait the council on the decision. So uh, on this point, I think that because in the rules of the parliament, it, is, it exists, as you know, this uh, method of the Agora, I think that uh, the, the, I mean, the, the civil society has to ask uh, the parliament to, to uh, start to, to uh, uh, organize this kind of uh, uh, debate with the citizens uh, and not waiting the, the council. I saw, and I will send you, the paper uh, made by the Croatian presidency. And uh, as concern as the citizens, the only thing that they say we have to consult the citizens as they made in 2018 and 2019. Or if the participation of the citizens is a kind of consultation, I think that we have to say thank you very much. We don't we have no interest about this kind of consultation online. So I think that we, we must be very aware about the risk that this conference uh, will be a conference which the, the citizens will be consults, consulted in a very old, uh, old way. The, sec the third point is that uh, uh, until the end of this year, as you know very well, the main uh, discussion that will be made by the institution is the discussion on the budget. So uh, I think that uh, 
uh, as civil society, there is a great risk that the Council will adopt a multi-annual financial framework with the reduction of the budget, because they give more importance to the European recovery fund and not to the normal policies, Europe for Citizens, Erasmus, Europe for Culture, and so on. There is this big risk that the Commission will accept the compromise of the Council with the reduction of the budget. And I think that as civil society, we have to refuse this kind of approach. And because the Parliament has no power concerning the own resources, but has the power to reject the multi-annual financial framework, I think that as civil society, we have to uh, uh, address ourselves to the Parliament, saying if the uh, multi-annual financial work framework is a, in a reduction of the former multi-annual financial work framework, the Parliament says to reject this, uh, this uh, budget. You remember that uh, Spinelli started his fight in the European Parliament in 79, uh, pushing the Parliament to reject the budget. So I think that that is the thing that we have to say, that this kind of multi-annual financial framework is not uh, adequate uh, and, uh, uh, to face the, the problems of the Europe as uh, it is now. So uh, that is a point in which uh, the Parliament could play a role. It asks eventually to organize a, a conference of the stakeholders in, uh, in December, that this could be a, a kind of participatory democracy. You know that uh, the participatory budget that was invented the, in Porta Alegre, uh, we have to su support this idea of uh, a participatory budget. So they ask the parliament to, to organize a, a debate with stakeholders in December before the adoption of the budget. I think that that's a point in which we can play a role because the civil society organizations have a very concrete interest about the common policies. And so on this point, I think that what we can find uh, uh, alliance in, uh, in the civil society. That is the, the point in which uh, I think that we can play play a role. Thank, Thank you, Richard. Uh, if I can make you a question um, on the on on the thing that I said at the beginning um, about uh, a European citizen initiative. Do you think we could uh, present uh, propose? an amendment to the EU budget in order to ask for uh, uh, the same amount of money that is actually spent to inform people about European elections, uh, to inform them about European participatory democracy tools, for example, European citizen initiative. So in a way to use the budget uh, to create to create an obligation for the European Union to inform European citizens about European participation. Do you think it's something? I mean, do you agree? And do you think it's something feasible? And we could work on that together? No, I, I, it's over for me. Yeah, I I, yes. I I totally agree, and I think that we have to insist that the, the program Europe for Citizens that is a the very important program, could have a, a line dedicated to this point. So because the idea is to reduce the program Europe for citizens, we have to say that we have to increase the program Europe for citizens. In the Europe for citizens, one part of the citizen, Europe for citizens program has to be this uh, support uh, to communicate the uh, citizens initiative. The second point, you know that in Europe we have 450 Europe Directs that are this network of information centers in Europe. Uh, there are 450 centers of, of, to inform the citizens. The idea of the, of the European Commission is to reduce the number of the, the, this, this kind of centers for the next three years. All these centers are, uh, have a, a very uh, strong relationship with the citizens 
on the territory that is not the case for the representations of the European Commission in the, in the member states. So uh, we have to ask to uh, increase the number of centers to inform the, the citizens. Uh, so that is another point in which we have to ask the Commission to uh, give more money for this kind of Arab directs, because this Arab directs had the role and the mission and the duty to inform the citizens about the, their powers at the European level. So the two, the both. The one is to... Excuse me, Virgilio, could we propose also that this point um, can be uh, a physical uh, signature point, I mean, places in which you can find European citizen initiatives and peti petitions that are active and that can be signed in those places? Why not? Why not? Yeah, because their role is to, uh, to uh, meet the citizens and because they are 450, that is a kind of nervous system in, uh, in Europe. I think that uh, they, their role is also to open their, their doors to the citizens. So why not? That, uh, this network is very important. And I think that the, the idea of the Commission to reduce the, the members of this network is, is uh, uh, very dangerous. So I think that uh, we have to increase. It's not a lot of money. It's millions of euros, not billions. And so if you take into account the billions for European recovery fund, uh, we, we, we speak only about millions of euros. That is very low uh, uh, level of budget. And so uh, there is no reason to, de to decrease the, the money for this kind of centers. Uh, it's not a lot of money. These uh, centers receive 25,000 euros each year uh, for their role. It's not a big uh, amount of money. So I think that uh, we have to ask the parliament to amend the budget for 2021 amend the budget on the point, because this, the, the parliament has the final uh, uh, word on the budget at the end okay. of, of the which is the, good, which is the good timing to propose this kind of things? Uh, in the maximum in September, because the, the, the parliament has to introduce amendments to the budget of 2021, uh, one on the Europe for citizens, and the second about the Europe Directs. Apart the fact that the Europe Directs are centers not only of the Commission, but also of the Parliament. They, they, uh, uh, they have to answer uh, to both the institutions. So that is the reason because it's very important to support uh, this kind of network that exists uh, at European level. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Virgilio. So we will see if it will be possible to work on that initiative uh, for and present it for maximum September. Um, I think that since no other uh, speakers are joining the discussion, um, we can go to the conclusion, of course, if there is some uh, other intervention or comment, uh, feel free to, to speak. Um, I can also uh, do a kind of a summary of what uh, we have, what is emerged from that uh, edition of the Council. Uh, I think that with um, the intervention of Anne in particular, we had uh, relevant elements to give uh, more substance, we can say, to our request of equal dignity and equal funding between uh, um, participatory democracy and electoral democracy uh, at the European level. So I think that I hope that, Anne, uh, you can share with us your notes uh, and uh, we, we, will, uh, we can use it to, to uh, enrich uh, the, our letter to Commissioner Jurova and our request. Uh, yeah. Uh, if you have a comment, please. Uh, yeah, just so just you know, I posted the full catalogue of ideas. It's basically where I took my notes from in the chat. Um, I can also share just the notes that I took from it, but there you really have an overview of different 
topics, okay. the biggest of which is democracy. So um, feel free to use what, whatever you want to or need to. Great, thank, thank you for sharing the catalog. So I will uh, copy and paste to have it saved. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so, yeah, apart from that, I think it's been a very rich uh, discussion. We also discover about the program uh, uh, Europe for Citizens. Thank you, Marie, for that. I think we can also see if we have some uh, uh, chance to apply for, for funding for this program. Um, and uh, I think thank you, everyone. Thank you also, Alessandro, for telling us more about your ECI. I think we absolutely uh, shared the, the objective of the, the initiative and uh, as humans, but also maybe other organization of the council uh, can be happy to join the initiative. Um, Marco, do you have some uh, other comments? Okay, I think we can uh, finish now and uh, have a nice uh, have a nice day. See you soon. Thank you all. Thank you. Ciao. 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 Bye. -bye. Ciao.